Hey guys! So the topic this week is going to be touch training and clicker training troubleshooting. Basically troubleshooting the problems that you guys are running into with both of those methods. Um, we were going to do flight training, but I think we will try to save that for next week because our time frame just didn't work out and we want to take the birds outside to be able to talk to you guys about that. So, anyways, um, the other thing I want to go over with the basically hands-off training with clicker training and touch training is how you can use capturing. And capturing basically means to capture a behavior with the clicker. So you can use this with training the wave. Um, if your bird just, I did this with Rasta, the Alexandrian parakeet, and you can see that in some of the videos. On YouTube, I actually made a playlist of all of his videos so you can find it easier. Anyways, um, basically what this means is you wait for the bird to just go up and scratch its head. And you click and go over and give a treat. And this is a little bit of a slower process because you have to basically wait. And what I did was I would work on my computer facing um, Rasta and I would just kind of be watching him out of the corner of my eye. And every time I would see him do it, I would click and I would go over and just drop a treat in a bowl for him. And eventually he learned how to wave by doing this. And you end up using shaping in capturing because one, what I did was I captured the behavior of scratching his head and then I shaped it into a wave. And the, how I did that was I had to click precisely at the time that he then lifted his foot but didn't quite scratch. So that's shaping the behavior. It's changing it from the scratching motion to just before the scratch, scratching motion and just capturing this instead of this. So it's really interesting, but it's a really fun one to use and it's actually how I ended up training Bondi to do the rock out. Um, she would actually spin her head around in a circle anytime I had her close to a mirror. So I simply captured it and then I withheld um, giving her the treat one time so that she would exaggerate the head motion and it became a really big head motion. Um, and so anyways, yeah, that was like the start of that whole thing. So that's how you can use capturing and basically teach tricks that are very hands-off. The thing I wanted to talk about with touch training is how you can use it to get your bird to step up. Touch training is one of those things where um, it's basically target training. And what it does is a lot of people use target training to get horses to go into trailers because the act of going into a dark trailer is scary for, for some horses. Um, but the act of touching a target is not. So what they'll actually do is put the target inside the horse trailer, and the horse will, is no longer being asked to go inside the trailer, it's being asked to touch a target. So it just redirects the bird, um, and it's the same for stepping up for some birds. Some birds are scared to step up, but if you're just asking them to touch a target that happen to be, happens to be over somebody's hand, so it has to step up on the hand in order to touch the target, it's a completely different behavior to the bird. So it's pretty cool. And normally when I recommend people use this for getting the bird to step up, I recommend they keep their hand on a flat surface. So you would ask the bird to step onto your hand or even onto your fingertip. You would click and give a reward for touching the stick over your hand. And then eventually when the bird is on your hand and touching the stick, you would then target it back off. Um, you wouldn't just immediately go, the bird's on my hand, yay, and like walk around with the bird because that's just completely killing all of your training. Um, so yeah, I show this in more detail and explain it uh, probably a lot better in all of my Rasta blogs and videos if you guys want to check out that playlist on our YouTube. It's just youtube.com forward slash bird tricks, and then if you just scroll down, you'll see Rasta the Alexandrian parakeet, and you can see what I did with him because it was very slow moving progress. Um, he was a very fearful bird. So if you're having that same issue with touch training, th those videos will really help you. Just a heads up, some of our footage didn't make it into last week's video, so we're actually going to include it in this week's video. Um, so enjoy! <laughs> hey everyone! So this week is kind of a weird week because it is install week, which means we got a brand new cast, and it means that the theater is booked solid. So we can't actually like, show you guys training like we wanted to, unless it's backstage, which is where we are now. So we're going to go see the birds and take care of them and show a little bit more behind the scenes stuff that way. Want to say good morning? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Stage fright? <laughs> yeah. Babies! Baby. Oh, good girl, Lily. Babies! <laughs> Baby! So crazy! Oh! Uh oh. <laughs> Nobody saw that. Hey! What are you doing? So hard to focus. Uh -huh. 
A little higher? Yeah. So that both of them get some? Okay, but not his head. There you go. Perfect. Hey guys, today we're going to talk a little bit about clicker conditioning your bird. And that means basically getting the bird to understand that click equals treat 100% of the time. That might change in the future that 100% of the clicks equals a treat. But uh, for the beginning, it's always one click equals one treat. Again, you want to use the a treat that your bird's favorite, that it's not getting in its daily diet, and something that um, that it's hungry for. You want to be a little bit motivated. And uh, so in this case, I'm and using small. pine nuts. Yeah, you also want to be very small. So if you give a full almond, you're going to be in trouble. But uh, using something small they can eat quickly is going to be helpful. So pine nuts are good. A little bit of millet is okay. Um, sometimes like little almond chunks. That's okay. So just find something that your bird really likes. And the key again is that it's hungry and it doesn't have that in its daily diet. The way you get the bird used to understanding that click equals treat is you wait for the bird to be doing something good. I would say she's being good right now. And click, I give a treat. It's that easy. I keep the clicker in my right hand, treat to my left hand. Click, get a treat. Now watch her very closely on this next one. Watch your body posture become more alert once, you, uh, once she hears a click. See the way now she's looking for the treat? When you see that sign, it means that your bird is now a clicker conditioned. So this usually will take one to three uh, training sessions. Keep in mind all your training sessions should only be two to five minutes tops. You really don't want to go more than five minutes. Two is about the optimal time in my opinion for most birds. If you say your bird's different and it can go for a long time, don't do it. Your bird's not different. Your bird may go for a long time and it's going to become bored with training very quickly. So once your bird is conditioned that click equals treat, then you can start introducing the stick. Now we just use a chopstick that hasn't been used by a person before, that's very important. And you want to hold the stick just far enough away that the bird can't eat the whole stick. You wait for them to just barely touch it, and you give them a treat. All right? You can also direct them over to the other side, do the same thing, and give them the treat. Now you're rewarding the bird for touching the stick, not for biting and tearing into the stick. So one of the problems that happens is people oftentimes have a bird that just tries to shred the stick. Here's how you fix that. You want to hold the stick just far enough that the bird can't reach anything other than just the tip. If I hold it this way, she can eat the whole thing. But at this point, she can just barely touch the tip. I'm going to bring it as close as I can. And she just bumped it with the outer part of her beak. That's how you keep your bird from destroying the chopstick every time that you're, you're working with them um, with the touch training stick. So now some of the problems that can occur is what if your bird's afraid of the click or what if your bird is afraid of the stick? So we'll start with the clicker. If the clicker's too loud, put it in your pocket and depress it through your pocket. So it'll be a lot quieter. You'll hear here in one sec. So you can probably barely make that out on the TV. But um, that's one way if the bird's afraid of the click, you can do that. Now if the bird's afraid of the stick, there's a few different ways that you can do this. You can reward the bird for just simply looking at the stick with relaxed body language, and you're training the bird to look at the stick. So what that would look like, so we can turn around here. Right here you see she has an interest in the stick, so I would click there. I'm gonna demonstrate it with myself instead. Let's say I'm the bird and I'm afraid of the stick. The stick's here, I'm kind of running away from it. The second I look back at it, you can click, and then give the bird a treat. And then the next step, you'll be able to get a little bit closer to where the stick's coming in, the bird's afraid of it, pause there, wait for the bird to look back at it, click, and then give the bird the treat. Another thing that you can do is also lure the bird with, uh, with a treat. We don't usually use luring, but this is one of those cases where it's, it's not necessarily a bad way to use it. So if the bird is afraid, I would put the two closer together as I give the treat, like this, and from the side so you have a little bit better angle. I would start bringing them closer together like that. It might start at this distance, then the next time would be this distance, the next time would be this distance, and eventually the bird touches the stick instead of the treat. And the way that that would work is you have them both side by side, and you just move the treat away at the last second so the bird has to touch the stick. That's a couple of tips I'm able to, uh, on ways to be able to get your bird used to target training or touch training, and hopefully get them over some of those fears that they might have. So right now we're going to go ahead and show you how to do some touch training to get the bird in and out of the cage. This would be used when you're working with an aggressive bird that may maybe bite your fingers or you just want to take the training to the next level before moving on to like flight training or something like that. So to do this, <coughs> excuse me, we're going to use one of these road cases. 
No, uh, this m could cause a problem in some situations if the bird's afraid of the object I'm trying to put the bird onto. Uh, in this case, I'm going to work through it. I have no idea if Cressy's afraid of it or not, so we're going to go ahead and see. They're motivated. As you can see, we're in the middle of changing cages. That's why the conures are quiet, because they're eating. <laughs> but uh, first, I guess before I'd open this up, I would warm her up in the cage to make sure that she's willing to work. So she touches, hits a treat. And you want to have them move over to another area. How many birds moving around the cage and willing to accept treats by moving around? You know that you're good to be able to continue on from there. So now I'll open up the cage. I'll first target her to this front part. And then we'll see if we can get her out here like this. And again, she may be afraid of this, I have no idea. Yeah, you can see that she's hesitant. So here's how we're gonna do this. I'm gonna have her come over this way. See if I can get her to come out even further. Get her on that side wall. There we go. Now she's part way out. Let's see if I can get her to come down here. It's a little bit weird because the ship's rocking, so the door is not staying open. <laughs> Hopefully, you don't have that problem. There we go. So you can see how we were able to work through that in small steps. Now she's on the item that she wasn't so sure about. So I'm going to, just because she knows the spin, I'm going to go ahead and do some similar familiar type training with her. Not going to be too too advanced with this. She is confident with the waves. We'll cue that. So the reason that you cue something like the wave is she's really confident with that. She's done it a lot of times. And so when you're training a bird and you're pushing them beyond their comfort level, like you saw she was hesitant to come onto this or she may be hesitant to learn a new trick, you want to go back to something the bird's very confident with, like the wave, because that's something that I know will boost her confidence and encourage further training. So come back here, we'll target her to there. Put the treat in the bowl for that time. And then we'll have her come right back here into the cage, touch the stick, get a treat, and just try to get her to go in there to get the treat, close the door, and you've got, if it's an aggressive bird, you're able to put the bird back away. And then I don't want to end the session there because the bird could assume, uh, take that as being negative for getting locked back in the cage. So I'll do a little bit more training inside the cage. So we're ending on a positive note for a few more treats. And there you have it. How to basically target your bird in and out of the cage. Very simple. Hope you guys like that. So one of the things that comes up a lot is the issue of potential overtraining. So you might be noticing if your bird's flying off and not wanting to train with you, it could be because you've overtrained in the past and your bird associates your training sessions with exhaustion. Just like if you're at school learning math or algebra or geometry, and if you go too long, you, you just, you shut down, you quit, you hate the subject and you get very frustrated. Well, the birds are the same way. Keep in mind you're training them something that's very complex and it may be a lot of little small successes without a big win in there. So that's why with, um, with the touch training, if you're pushing a bird, like you saw when I bring Cressy out onto the case, she wasn't sure about it, I break up her challenging session with, with a big win. Um, so that's important as well. But if you get into the overtraining area, you're gonna have your bird flying off, not interested, not taking the treat, and you, you could say your bird's super hungry, it's down 10% in its weight, and it's still not wanting to train. It's probably because you've overtrained it in the past. So now that you kind of have an understanding of what overtraining results in, what's it look like? Overtraining could look um, basically like you take the bird out, you're, you're, you're training it for 10 minutes or 15 minutes. Birds are not supposed to train for that long. Um, if you're training a bird for two minutes, that's what it should look like. You should take the bird out, do a quick session like you just saw, and then put the bird away, make sure it's a positive experience, and leave it at that. If you're really pushing the bird for more than two, two to five minutes max, you're, you're going to be overtraining the bird, and it, again, it ends up with the bird not wanting to train, the bird losing interest, the bird flying off, the bird not taking treats, all of which because the bird associates you with that frustration of, you know, let's just call it a marathon algebra class. You'd get very bored and annoyed and frustrated with it. So you have to be careful for that. So the other thing about that is to make sure that you don't think, well, well my bird's different. Um, it's not. If your bird's willing to do a 15 minute training session, it's just because you've been lucky so far, but eventually it'll catch back up with you. And eventually it'll catch back up with you and the bird's just not gonna wanna train. It'll start to shut down and shut off 
and not want to have any anything to do with you. So be very, very careful. You can do two to five minute training sessions and set a timer. And like literally, go get a kitchen timer, set it for five minutes and start. You'll be surprised how short the training session is and how short it feels. But again, like I said, leave the bird wanting more. Just want to fly to you. Oh, almost there. You want to leave the bird wanting more like that? <laughs> he wants to train. Um, and, and just make sure that you end the session. Our thing, we talk about it a lot, is the second that you hear, that was awesome, I just want to do one more, stop. End on the really good moment and leave it at that. So hopefully that helps you with the overtraining. And um, hopefully our distracted backstage videos aren't too annoying to watch. I hope you guys are liking these. <laughs> uh, we're laughing because I was trying to get proportionate because I felt like a small little human being in this <laughs> take. Um, so we wanted to talk about some of your questions revolving around clicker training and touch training. Some of that was, what can you use other than a clicker? What? And you can use... Uh you asked me what, or you're asking yeah, me Yeah, I thought at? you were looking at me funny. I'm looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> you can use a, like a Snapple cap, because sometimes they make that little clicking, popping sound. Yeah, if you put your finger in the crease part. You can also use a whistle. When we do some of our outdoor free flight training, we use a Fox 40 whistle. Um, and uh, it's it basically, all you're trying to do is replace you're trying to mark the exact moment that the bird does something you want. So it can be anything. Um, you can even say the word good. It's just not as fast or as precise. Yeah, where um, a click marks the exact second that my hand would touch your shoulder. You could click that moment versus if you say good. Well, were you saying good because I reached in? Were you saying good because I touched? Or were you saying good because I pulled back? See how long that bridge is? Yeah. You want to make sure it's something that's real, very precise. You can mark the exact moment, whether it's a whistle, a clicker, a snapple cap, anything like that. Um, the other thing you guys asked if, is if birds should be trained one at a time or together. And what we've always done is we've always trained our birds one at a time. And then once they are trained, we will then sometimes house them together, such as budgies. We'll train them one at a time. So um, if they're wild, that's pretty much taming and training all at once. And then once one is tame and trained, then we'll work with the other one and then we can actually house them together. Because that means they'll, they'll both come out willingly and stuff. Otherwise, if you put one trained one in with one wild one, usually the trained one will become wild. Well, and the other thing about that too is if you're trying to work with two birds at the exact same time, then you're going to run into issues in the very beginning about which bird is getting reinforced for which behavior. After you've done one-on-one -on -one training sessions, they seem to be able to tell the difference between, okay, now there's two birds in the room, but you're engaged with this one bird. They understand the difference, but in the beginning, it's best to only stick with one bird in the room. As you get more advanced, like we've trained three macaws at the same time because they're all doing the same behavior. Flight together. Uh, we called it juggling. You might have seen the video on YouTube. It was at our house in Orlando where we would have three macaws and we'd send them back and forth to the railing and, you know, up to the railing, back down to us. And we had all three birds. They were getting reinforced the entire time. So there are exceptions, but in the beginning, always stick with just training one bird. Yeah, and the cool thing that Dave was talking about where we trained all three at once is it actually makes their recall better because it makes it faster because they become in competition with each other. So sometimes it works really well, but then when I tried uh, training Jinx and Bondi together for the retrieve to put like a coin into a bowl, Jinx was like going after Bondi because she was getting it right and he was getting it wrong and he was getting frustrated and she was getting scared off and so it really depends on what you're training um, to make it so you can train both birds at once or you should do one at But it is a good point. You can use it to encourage the other birds to do it better, um, better <laughs> through competition or through observational learning but those are kind of exceptions and most people, 99.9% .9 of the people will not fall into that so um, I'm, I know one of the other topics, I will say the same thing. Please don't feel like you are the exception to this because um, it's probably not the case with, with your bird. So um, yeah, so that's, yeah. The, that's that tip. The other question, which we kind of gently touched on, is if birds should be trained if they're in the same room. So a lot of you, a lot of you are like wondering if you have two birds in the same room, if you take one out and work with it in that room and the other bird can hear the clicker, if that confuses the other bird. Do you want to answer this one? Uh, go ahead. Um, we've done this with our birds, and because all of our birds have already been trained, they understand, like Dave said, when one is being engaged and being trained and being reinforced for the behavior and the others aren't. That doesn't mean that the others won't beg and start spinning and talking and doing little things on cue so that they can hopefully get a treat, but they do understand that that's the one being engaged and that's the one being trained. If you feel like it's confusing your birds, um, then you can just simply take your bird to a separate room and train. Yeah, and it's best to train them in a neutral area anyway, like we've been talking about, where... You're, you're far away, so... Uh, 
yeah, yeah. and that kind of leads to the next one is um, a lot of people are having problems with their birds getting distracted or flying off from training and if your bird is becoming distracted because of, there's other birds in the room then yes you should totally leave that room and go somewhere else where it won't hear the other bird it won't be distracted by the other bird you need to go somewhere where there's very few distractions i know patty has recommended people start training in a bathroom just because it's a small enclosed room there's very little distractions that's what i used to do with parakeets um, in the beginning you can totally do that you can completely do that we actually dedicated a room upstairs simply just to training in our in our house in florida um so you just kind of do what you have to do but as far as birds flying off from training that can either be fear so you're pushing your bird way too fast or it might be training diet and that your bird just doesn't give a crap I, either way it means that you're making a mistake so if your bird's leaving it's because it's not hungry motivated enough ladies or... and gentlemen we're at 10 minutes 10 minutes till top of show 10 minutes <laughs> once again we are 10 minutes till top of show thank you uh you should probably get mics it's show time if you can't tell so yeah we got to go get mic'd up but um if your bird's flying off during training, it's because you're making a mistake. So assess what's going on and try to figure that out on your own. But most likely, like Jamie said, it's either food related or it's fear related, or you just simply are going too far in the training where your bird is just not simply ready to be trained outside of his cage. Yeah, so, that's a very good point. So anytime you push a failure point, go back to the last successful um, part of the training curve, if you will. So if you're trying to get the bird to come out of the cage and fly to you, and you've got it out of the cage and it's going just barely to the T stand, you know, but then it's starting to screw up. Well then work back with it in the cage. That's where it was possibly the most successful the last time. Do more target training, more touch training through the cage bars. Make it go in and out of the cage on cue and then slowly increase the distance that it has to go from its cage to the T stand or to your hand. And it's, you know, don't make the mistake too once a bird comes out of the cage. Don't just, hey, he's out of the cage and run off in the other room. <laughs> or you're, you're, uh, you're breaking all the training you just did. It needs to be very positive for the bird. So, um, small, successful steps. Very small steps. Yeah, I think a lot of you guys get really <laughs> excited. And it happens to us too. We get really excited when you make like one really big leap and progress and you want to keep going but you really need to stay at that exact moment and you need to work on that for a few days and just stay at that level for a few days and then progress um, just for the comfort level of the bird and it's really building a foundation that you can then it allows you to screw up more the more foundation you make with your bird so the better training you do and the more baby steps you take the better and stronger your foundation is with your bird and then when you accidentally screw up it's not as bad it's not as far as many steps back as it normally would be. Perfect. With that being said, I got to get my mics on and we got to get birds ready because the show starts in eight minutes. Ring, watch very closely as Bondi takes your ring. In a moment, she's going to fly it out to you. She'll land on your shoulder. And she'll walk down your shoulder like this. And walk the ring in. wanted to start doing in these videos are answering follow-up questions so questions that we get after you guys have already applied the techniques that we've or advice that we've given you and you have follow-up questions we like to answer those so one of the ones we got is what if not everybody in your household agrees on your whole discipline thing if you missed our previous video it's on how to discipline your parrot properly so go check that out so you're not two in the dark on this but um, basically if you guys aren't all on the same page and somebody in the household isn't following um, what you want to do. First of all, I would use our training methods on them. <laughs> so I would put the birds in a place where you can easily access them, but that person can't. So if that person likes to spray the bird or cover the bird or use techniques that you don't want um, happening to your bird, make it harder for them to be able to do so. Make it inconvenient for them to do so. Um, can you put the bird in your office? Can you lock the door? Can you just make it harder to access the bird so that they um, they aren't tempted to do it and they can't as easily easily do that. Um, hide the spray bottle. Hide anything that they could use to cover the bird. Hide, um, just hide anything that they might use as a negative sort of thing that you can, that within reason of course. Um, 
And then I would also train without that person home or train without that person in the room so that you can make it like an everyday training session and make some progress without that person backtracking you or the bird. Um, you know, some people have a really bad habit of replying back to the back to a bird when it screams. Like some people were saying um, that they have people that will re reply back to their bird when it screams. You can reply back to your bird when it talks. That's that's reinforcing it. And if you want it to keep talking, then great. Um, so that is a way of reinforcing just with attention. But if you don't want it reinforced and it's screaming, you just have to figure out um, how to get the bird and the person separate in a way that makes it inconvenient for that person to punish the bird in a way you don't want to be happening. Um, be careful though, because like our bird, for instance, birds are super intelligent. So our birds, such as Bondi, we can put her on absolutely anybody but she knows when she's on a stranger that she can take advantage of them, so to speak. So she'll just like walk herself right up a stranger's shoulder and hang out. She doesn't do it to us because we don't allow her to do that. Um, we've trained her in respect of like how to be with us. But with a stranger, she knows that she can get away with it. It's kind of like the same with horses. I don't know how many of you guys ride horses, but I ride horses. And when I ride my friend's horse, he will always act different with me than he will with her. He's like on his best behavior with her where, where he might try something with me knowing that I'm new and I'm not her. So. Um, keep that in mind that it might end up training the bird to be great with you and horrible with that other person which is just even more proof that your training methods are working and theirs are not and theirs are ineffective um although it may drive your spouse nuts if that's the person that's that's doing it so anyways um those would be my recommendations for people that don't follow your rules um, the other question we got was how to keep a bird from chewing on your couch. And I would say, one, when I asked Dave this, he was like, why is the bird allowed on the couch then? <laughs> um, so probably not allowing your bird on the couch since it's not doing desirable behavior would be a start. A second thing would just be like covering the couch with something that it either can chew because it's chewing the couch or um, covering it with something that maybe it doesn't like so that it deters it from, or deters it from coming to the couch at all. Um, those are two things. The other thing that we showed in actually One Day Miracles is training the bird <clears throat> to either station, like um, station means go to its place, so train it to go to a certain perch or something that's not anywhere near the couch, or um, just recall train it, so train it to come from that spot. We had a, we had a, I believe it was an African gray, African gray in One Day Miracles that would like go to a spot that the owner didn't want it to, and so we taught her how to recall it and worked on just recall. Um, so you could check that out. It's birdtricks.com forward slash miracles, I believe. Anyways, that should really help you, those tips and tricks. So our winner this week is Jared Hunt. We, I actually picked your comment because you had asked a question about neutral zones and we were able to answer that. And it actually sparked an idea for us on doing the whole follow-up section in our videos as far as answering like one to two follow-up questions like yours. So. For us, we feel like it's really, really informative and it's and it just sparked interest in us and being able to make these videos better for everyone. So thank you, Jared. And please email us at info at .com and let us know which product you'd like. You want a better? You love Cressy? Yeah. Can you give her a kiss? Oh. Hey, baby. <laughs>